If you're on a low income and a tenant living in the inner city, your days are automatically numbered. The only security left is owning your own bit of turf. But that's a choice open to less and less people. And even then, you're not safe. And what's the government's response to all of this? It's ever been, OK, Housing Commission, you take care of the people. In these streets as kids we played, from the park we often strayed. We knew each other like a family. Mothers, sisters, fathers, cousins, they were around us in their dozens. It was what you call a big community. Oh, with the Smiths and the McMurdies, we'd face the dirty thirties. With eviction fights and coppers at the door. And we hoped the House Commission would resolve the whole position of where we were to live forevermore. When now houses were in bits from the Housing Commission's blitz, we could go and put our names down in the queue for a flat up in the sky where those gaga seagulls cry round the towers they would build in Waterloo. Waterloo, oh Waterloo, I won't ever leave you And the district of South Sydney that I love We built ourselves a dream on South Sydney's champion team And we'll never leave you good old Waterloo And we really wanted a house, a house of our own. We looked around quite a lot and finally settled on this. It cost sort of every bit of available cash that we had. We'd been in units prior to that and we'd had all the, the fights from next door heard through the walls and the plumbing upstairs and we just really wanted our own privacy. We felt very at home in the whole area because the people, we'd grown up with those people. There were nice little places you could go to for a cheap meal, shops around the corner that were open till 10 o'clock at night. And that house really meant something to us. By sheer chance, Mum met up with some people and they'd been very concerned about the lack of open space, the lack of facilities. And we were asked, would we like to join with some of the action that was going on? We'd been working together happily for about three months with Housing Commission tenants and some of the church people, planning a public meeting for something like the 21st of May. On the 14th of May, we went to our letter boxes and there was this letter. Dear residents, on the 28th of April, you were gazetted as a housing area. It was like a bomb sort of went off. Gazetted as a an area zone for future housing, what the hell did it mean? At present at Waterloo, there are 500 one and two storey dwellings, 500. We would replace them with 800 one, two and three storey dwellings. Uh, 800, so there'd be more of those. But in addition, we would provide 1,200 units in high rise, yes, admittedly in high rise, but very carefully designed for uh, young married couples without families and for older couples with teenage children. Now, many of these have lived in high rise all their life. The important point is no one would be forced to live in high rise accommodation, it would be a matter of choice. People up and down the street, I can remember those first days, people were racing around, so sort of saying, what's this proclamation? People would look at this schematic drawing and saying, I can't find my house. Well, they couldn't find their house, they couldn't find their damn street. It was just that sort of thing to shoot people's security to hell. We didn't know when the resumption might take place. It was like a nothing. You're in prison in a frozen state. Now, this is a beautiful photo. Oh, lovely. Looks Bobby. glorious. Bobby. The utopia of tomorrow. And as we've just been pointed out, there isn't room for a school, because if you put houses in, you can't have a school. If you put a school, you can't have houses. What sort of planning is that? The most important thing is that we do not allow a totalitarian bureaucracy done in the name of what is good for you take over unquestioningly. 
What was the, the real effect of this on, on the people in the area? People could not uh, sell, transfer, uh, repair, renovate uh, or alter their properties uh, without the previous permission of the Commission. In other words, uh, it was, it's called a freeze and that's exactly what it is. So in fact having the freeze on for a year just in itself has caused quite a lot of disruption oh, to the lives of the people. sort of to people. Um, but as I say, the whole thing is this total blanket, you know, nothing. What can you do? Um, the migrant peoples can't understand that they're living, you know, they felt they were living in God's own country, sort of a, the beautiful democracy, Australia. But they can't quite equate this with whether they've come from um, fascist or sort of um, um, communist, they don't seem to, seem to think there's any difference at all, and certainly um, we can't see much difference. What I, can't, I can't restart again from beginning. What sort of an offer have you had so far? They pay 12 and 13,000. That's not even half price to buy a house, another house around Sydney. Mm. Have you looked around at, at poor alternatives? <clears throat> have you looked for somewhere else to go? No, no. I like to stay here. And I, I do everything to stay here. I stick with the group and I do my best. It took us quite some time, but what we did begin to realise that they were not just new plants. They'd been things that people had been working on for 25 years. That was one of the reasons why we could afford to buy on sort of so little. It was supposed to, you know, it was a really extraordinary thing. Let's go and talk to the local council, a total Labor council. These were the people we knew, these were the people behind us. And they knew. And they'd been a party to the whole darn thing. We couldn't really understand this because here these were strong, industrial, working class areas where you know, the whole union movement, the whole ALP had started. It started in the railway workshops and the railways are still the greatest employer of labour in our areas. The 1890s were, were terrifying times and the employers organised and they attempted to smash the unions before they were even on their feet. The unions needed a political wing. The old ALP was sort of certainly the mateship, the socialising element, it was everything. Where all your problems were fought out, taken to. Old Ag Charge, who's Grong Bill Darm of our local branch, she was a foundation member of the women's boot trade. She went to work at 12. Her father was one of the founding members of the, the transport unions in our area. And she remembers those days when Dad was out of work 15 months at a time. They were bitter days and weary days when plague had stained the streets. The bank accounts of business and the landlords were the cheats. They blamed the terraced houses when the cause was poverty. They sent the wreckers in to crush the bricks and unity, made ships strong. True blue flowering in the labour leaves and the lanes of Waterloo. It was years of cruel campaigning till labour took the lead, believing they'd an answer to the working people's need. The workers built that shining dream, but few could ride. To a quarter acre mortgage on the rainbow's other side, made ship strong. True blue, souring in the labour leagues and the lanes of Waterloo. Build the bridge. Here was employment opportunities, solve the problem of the slums and overcrowding on the south side of the harbour. Typical sort of mistakes of the planners. It totally ignored the whole dynamics of the real estate market. When those thousands of workers were laid off, we were right in the middle of the greatest depression the world had ever seen. Here was this great bridge, the access point out for those people, but how could they get out? They didn't have any jobs, they didn't have any dough, they were on the queues, they had their dull coupons in their pockets. 
the only alternative was squatting and sharing accommodation and moving to the fringe. I was leader of the unemployed, uh, our honourable secretary, and uh, we used to march through the streets of Sydney with a banner inscribed, rent to be paid by the government for the homeless. No more evictions. Demand double dole. We used to... Uh, they organised unemployed workers in suburbs. In Glebe, where I operated, there was about eviction at least two a week for years. And that happened in every suburb. As soon as there was a, an eviction, we put out the red flag and that showed the people that were in the fight. And we used to have sticks and have everything ready for the police. And sometimes they wouldn't come for two months and we'd still be in the house defending it. But we've resisted. We don't want to squat in iron shacks and tents on the edge of the city. Every worker has the right to a house. I was on the balcony listening to the speakers and I heard a call, here they come. And I looked out and saw the police arriving in a big bus and the police speeded out of the bus and fired a volley straight into the front room. Well, I got down onto my knees and, and as I was halfway down the stairs, the police broke through the back door and started to shoot up the stairs. Well, I jumped over the banister of the stairs onto the floor below and as I did, I was shot in the arm by a bullet. And I turned round to help Murphy, who was hit on the head with a baton. And they battened us pretty badly, calling us communist bastards. There was blood everywhere. Anyhow, they pushed me through the back door and as I went through, I was hit by other police and they hurled all the filthy insults that you can imagine at us, saying that Lang should pass a bill to shoot the lot of us at sight. And when I got out of the patrol in the police station yard, the police were lined up and they kicked and punched. And I said to one of the police, mind me arm, I'm shot in the arm. And he said, pity it wasn't your bloody heart, you red bastard. And he hit me across the shoulder with the baton. very, very different area to what it was when I first went into Parliament in 1917. Oh, in 1941, I set up the Housing Commission, and the Housing Commission is responsible for all of these magnificent drops of units. If there hadn't been any Housing Commission, there wouldn't have been this great development. So that, basically, uh, I suppose I'm entitled to take credit for making some contribution at any rate, you know, to the development of the area. And I suppose when it's all said and done, these people are probably living under better housing and finer housing conditions today than they'd known in the past. Mikel was a major figure in our area. He worked as a boilermaker and was an active trade unionist, moving quickly through the ranks and up through the party ranks at the same time. In 1941, he became the Premier. <laughs> Mikel didn't stop there either. Ten years later, he became Governor General of this country. Mikel always liked to feel he was a man of the people, but he was a servant of the party machine. 
And it was the party machine with the unions and the other socialist organisations that responded to the 30s calls for better planning. Everything depends on the plan we make today for tomorrow's housing in post-war Australia. Sydney itself had no plan. It just growed like Topsy. And with it grew slums, unsavoury, unlovely places of dirt, disease and child delinquency. Australia has a quarter of a million substandard houses, 85,000 already condemned as not fit for human habitation. We didn't plan, and we got bottlenecks of traffic congestion. We didn't plan our industries, and they grew up grimy and ugly, breathing smoke and dirt on the homes, if you can call them that, where young Australians are growing up. We didn't plan for playing spaces. We left the kids in the street. Here's what we could do now. Plan satellite towns on the fringe of the big ones. Sydney, for instance. New centres where we could build not just houses, but all the communities need to be healthy and happy and live a decent life. Here's a model of a model neighbourhood. Centrally situated is the health centre and the school. Bachelor service flats for those who need them. Finally, the community centre itself. The community centre is the focal point of all the world's replanning, whether it be the British, American or the Russian schemes. The community centre breeds that essential, the community spirit. The Department of Post-War Reconstruction estimates Australia will need 750,000 homes. Most of these will need to be houses low enough in cost for the average wage earner to be able to afford to live in. The plan is for modern houses with light and sunshine all around, with work made easy for the housewife by designing kitchen and dining room and lounge rooms adjacent. You, the parent, looking to the future. You, the soldier, who's fought for a better world to live in. Which do you want? This? Or this, a decent home or slum horror. We planned all in to win the war, and we're winning it. We have to plan as a nation, and not just for ourselves, if we're to win the peace. After the war finished, everyone wanted more. They wanted a new start something more than they'd had as kids. And so did the thousands of migrants who were flooding in to keep the wheels of industry turning. And the Housing Commission responded. And they built these people brick veneer suburbia. But at the same time, for the people of the inner city, mostly tenants, they also had a dream. Their dream was that one day they'd actually own their own home. You knew the people on your team, your own guys. You'd elected them and you waited you waited for them to take care of you. And there was every reason to be optimistic. The problem was that by the late 40s, the labour machine was getting out of touch. People who'd lived and been brought up in those slums now had their positions of power via the system, the party, in what became typical of these years, the windscreen survey. They all drive up in their cars, get out and look at this place. The kids following them saying, what's going on, mister? And these gentlemen nodding their heads and yes, yes, hmm, very solemn. And they'd been sold a dream by these people who saying, root out the filthy slums. They didn't really have the expertise. They had to depend on the experts. And all the things that they thought they were doing for their own people has worked right against their own class. Yeah, sure, there were unhealthy slums. But there were a whole series of other things that weren't equated in that. The strength of the families, the strengths of the neighbourhoods, the whole ties, all the good things that happened in our areas 
Well, when I first came here, I hated it. All I could see was concrete and tar, and I wondered where the lawns were because I come from the country. Everything was community. You know, you had a cracker night, so the whole street put in their crackers and people sat out on the street of a night because it was hot in those little tiny places. Even the old people, you know, most of the younger families used to do their shopping for them. Although the shops weren't as far, as, far away then, they were all little corner shops and that's where you got to meet everyone. It was just completely different to the flats and the way it is now. And then when the Housing Commission started to move people out, I think people were really desperate. Each day you'd see another house empty and it was like the end of their life. We always had the idea in those days too, you can't fight the, the government and you can't fight the Housing Commission and you can't fight the cops and everyone accepted what happened to them. Towers of concrete and steel are symbols of modern civilization. The Housing Commission of New South Wales, concerned with the displacement of low-income earners from inner city areas, has announced plans for another public housing project in the inner Sydney suburb of Waterloo. Over the past 25 years, redevelopment with public housing has brought back vigorous new life to this decaying old suburb. But in what would first appear to be a hostile environment, the Commission's main concern has always been to enrich the lives of the new tenants. Meanwhile, the present residents of Waterloo should readily accept this new dimension to their suburb. Throughout the planning and development stages, they'll be told what is happening and why. That was why Waterloo was chosen, because after examining all the areas in the city, it, it, we found that it was the most run down and debilitated. And uh, if you went back to where we, we, we now have buildings and saw how bad they were, and we can always show people photographs of that if they wish, you would be horrified at the shocking state of the ones that were demolished. Perhaps the better ones remain, but even most of those, if we took you on a tour, you'd see are not suitable for rehabilitation. Here it was, it was 1972. The proclamation was on, the plans had been drawn up, and the Commission was just waiting for people to sell up and move. As soon as that happened, in moved the Commission, neatly bricked up the front windows, but left the back door wide open. So, the next stage, in came the vandals. Blighting, running things down, till there's just no choice but to demolish. That was all part of a deliberate policy by the state government, the hidden agenda in that thing called the proclamation. Meanwhile, you know, suburbs away. Surrey Hills, Paddington. They'd been discovered by the higher income classes. We just could not buy in those areas. We didn't have the dough. You know, what, what, what are the options? Out there, 35 miles away. seemed to be the dumping ground for the victims of a new scheme that threatened to displace a whole community. But this time, the people had powerful allies. When the Sydney Cove Redevelopment Authority was formed, out came a brochure saying the following, come to the choicest real estate in the Southern Hemisphere. And this brochure was hawked around the world, encouraging people with hot money to come and invest in the El Dorado of the South Sea. Come and take a bit of Australia's heritage. That was what was on the agenda. Sir Robin Askin must go down 
as the man who destroyed Sydney. During the period that he has been Premier, he has become the darling of the property developers. We've seen property developers be amass huge fortunes only because the state government was prepared to go along with them. The rocks, Woolloomooloo, Chippendale, Waterloo, the communities were really at risk. 80% of it was the state government, state government development which was causing this incredible dislocation. We'd done all the usual things, we'd, we'd taken up the petitions and we'd got nowhere, absolutely nowhere. People were angry, uptight and prepared to fight. Resident action groups formed all over the city. It was an incredible period. We seemed to be rushing to demonstrations all over the place, picketing in the evening till midnight or the, the 9 till 3 a.m. stint. We knew that we had to support those other groups. It was the trades we made. We'll be at yours, but by heaven, when our turn comes, you better be back at ours. Strange alliances. The new people, the middle class, the people who'd moved back into the inner cities, the Builders Labourers Federation, a left-wing union, giving us the muscle. And, you know, it was on our terms. Every single one of our green bands have been initiated by, initiated by the people themselves. We have never set ourselves up as the authority. People have come to us because of the utter frustration, because of the corruption and bastardry of councils within the Sydney area. They have come to the people, the Builders Labourers, so as together, the residents themselves, the people themselves, and the People's Union forming a united front that's invincible. <laughs> We've been able to put bans on many areas, including the one that's in the eye of the hurricane now. And there are many thousands of people throughout this community who have expressed their gratitude. And in fact, what has happened is that there's a great movement of people who now realise that by their own strength and by their own militancy, they can do something about the environment in which they live. Stop this, because he hasn't got the guts to come down here and talk himself. Law and order! Why don't you come to council? Sydney Covering, force it over there. Law and order! Who's law and order? Who's law and order? The one we've got to live by. The one we've got to live by. Is that the one you're talking about? Or the one that they can live by? You're enforcing their law on us. All right, now you want no violence, you ought to be placed under arrest. Take the gentleman first and the lady second. Put you up to the different bands. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> what about the violence of this? This violence. They painted their blood on the bricks and the mud and the rocks and wool and the loo. On the chimney's tall, they fought for all to save old Sydney for you. And the finance police who made refugees of the families who battled there for years. Finished on their arse and they did their brass with the green man used to live. Askin and the developers were defeated in the rocks. And that happened in Woolloomooloo and in Glebe, where the expressways were stopped. But the state retaliated through the courts and launched a massive attack on the union. However, the resident action groups had grown stronger, they'd become more committed, more militant. And meanwhile, back in Waterloo, we were still sitting on the knife edge. Jack Burke had his dream and he was determined to make it come true. There was a slight split between us. There were those that thought we should write a lot more letters and try to be placatory, and I was very definite, advocating that we, uh, that we took a, a real stand against things, that we were confirmed that our stand of no surrender was the only one that we could do until we were recognised as a consultative body, not as just somebody to be talked to. Uh, this led us on to realising 
that we had to identify our fight for the people. This is why One Eye Jack Burke almost became our slogan. We picked a target and personalised it because yeah. we're being painted as, as the oh, opposition yes. to public housing, which is not true. I think what we were sort of trying to say, that people take change every day, incremental change, but that they don't take massive change. All of a sudden, the old Yugoslav raced across and sort of said they're demolishing in Wellington Street. So, God, with that, it was a case of get on the phones and phone people, we phoned the unions, we called the media. Beryl Tui came around. She had an epileptic fit and sort of collapsed at the demolisher's feet. He couldn't cope with that. Young Di Hughes and some friends, they stopped and they're screeching, don't pull these places down. You can't build any more of those things and put families and kids into them. You know the marriages that are breaking down in there. You know the sort of the problems. You know the sort of the psychiatric problems that are rising. You know three people have jumped sort of, you know, in three weeks over in Redfern, and that's what's got hit the papers. Not, you know, a lot of it else doesn't. You know, why? You know they lived in those flats? I certainly know the two of them lived in there, and I certainly know a woman sort of in, in East Lakes that jumped. And she lived there too. And they're, they're, they're suffering from loneliness and depression, isolation, and you just keep on doing this. One stage, I thought, what the, you know, shit, what the hell do you do next? And you thought that all the efforts had been in vain, we'd lost the upper hand, and all of a sudden, you know, like Scarlett O'Hara, let's think about tomorrow. And that's exactly what we did. The vigil began at 4.30 this morning when four people, including a 69-year-old woman pensioner, moved into the upper floor of this old dwelling and barricaded themselves inside. Their intention was to thwart plans by the New South Wales Housing Commission, who were due to demolish the house sometime later today. The police want to evict us, I suppose they'll have to come. And we'll have to be evicted, and we'll have to go in the paddy wagon. But uh, even Tom Uren has gone to jail for his principles, so I'm ready to go for mine. Under what circumstances are you prepared to leave the house? One of two. Either they demolish underneath us completely, or that Mr Burke will come and do what we've only asked him to do always, to discuss this in public, to debate this in public, and to allow the residents to make the decision. This was the tail end of a couple of years, and this was the really big test, and we pulled it off. The Commission backed down. We'd won the first stage of the battle, and that really had caught the Commission by surprise. They did scrap those early plans, but even if you thought God was sitting on your shoulder and rights were yours, you were not in a short fight. While we were trying to get to the consulting tables, the Queen, the Queen, yes, came to open the 32-storey high-rise tower blocks for the aged, which had not long been completed. It was extraordinarily funny. You can't sort of put the tragedy beside it. These trucks moved in from fubs, and up went the, the furniture into the four flats that the Queen might visit, and out came the tenants' furniture into those vans, and off they went. And within hours of the Queen leaving, back went people's furniture and out went the FUB's really nice furniture. And we had that grand opening of the big rock. Well, the figures we got in getting that piece of rock there were in close on $16,000. Yeah, the price it would have built a house. Where's the economics? Where's the, you know, what are the, what's the proportion? But then, I think you have to see it in line with the way the Commission handled things and just the way they go about things. Meanwhile, one of the first things we did was to organise a public meeting at the local town hall, calling on the Commission to start looking at rehabilitating the area rather than 
total demolition. And we did invite the Housing Commission, but unfortunately, they refused to attend. Another member of the committee, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Ian Mason. Um, I don't think it was entirely unexpected that the Housing Commission would take the sort of stand that they've taken. In fact, if you look at the history of the struggle of the people of Waterloo since the freeze went on our area, uh, you'll find that the Commission periodically, and I think more subtly right through, has adopted the same line. And I think that what we've always understood in the Waterloo community is that we help one another. And in fact, that unity is in fact strength. You know, we learn that you know, in, our, in our workplaces and we learn it in our community in general. And that the Commission at the present time, with their letter, with their attitude, wants us to, to be split. They don't want to, us to come together and, and discuss the vital issues that concern us. So, you know, certainly the Commission wants to deal with us individually because we're easier to overcome individually. In Waterloo, we were despairing of going anywhere. Well, anywhere but backwards. And yet, just a couple of suburbs away in Woolloomooloo, the Green Bands had won a major victory. In the Loo, blighting by the developers had actually reduced the population to only a few hundred. The pressure from the unions and residents forced the new federal Labor government to undertake total rehabilitation of the area. The irony was that it was the Housing Commission was actually going to carry out this work. There was hope for Waterloo yet. It means the resuscitation of the oldest settlement in Australia. Sydney is an extraordinarily extended city. There would be few cities in the world where so small a proportion of the population lives near the heart of the city. This trend will be reversed. There will now be people living in the centre of Sydney. Here we finally had a Labor government with a real commitment to the cities. And the resident action groups were actually getting the money and support to challenge the policies of the conservative state governments. And here it was now. Printing machines, office space, all the things people in the inner city had to find themselves previously. You know, miles more than the chook raffles that they'd been used to. So I threw my hat in the ring, applied for the job as the local community worker in our South Sydney area. And because of that job, I found myself in a much better position to take on bureaucrats like Burke. Things did start to happen. A consultative committee was set up by the new Labor Housing Minister. But it was very much on their terms, certainly not on ours. Burke and the Commission still didn't recognise our group, and it was only as individuals that we were invited. Every meeting, the Commission members, representatives, just kept turning up more and more lists of houses that they wanted to be demolished. So we insisted on the right to inspect the buildings. And then, you know, we really saw the end result of the Commission's blighting policy. Now on this particular film, we've got them. Holes, vandalism, you know, half the wall's taken out. And they're totally uh, unsafe at this stage. That's the best answer I've had for my argument, which I'm real stirred about. Everyone that you've talked about, five years ago they could have been re rehabilitated. Right. Now smart. they are bloody well derelict. Now they've got to come down. I can't argue with that when they've come to the stage of, of endangering people's health. But I can argue with the fact that we acknowledge that the Housing Commission, whether it be here in Waterloo or whether they do it in Daisyville or not, or anywhere else, has the right to close houses down. They do not have the right to close houses down. And if we bring in squatters, and I say bring in squatters, there are houses here that are going to be closed up, locked up, see the people in our community. I believe in those principles and so on. But in Waterloo, yeah, no way, just in Waterloo. It is so dicey, it is so tentative. Um, to do that just in Waterloo 
means the whole process is, you know, we're gone, we're finished. Uh, and, you know, six years, six years is too much to just throw away for just that sort of a thing. Things had changed since the early 70s. Squatting was an appropriate and a necessary tactic then, but now, politically, it would have worked against us. At least we were being consulted and we had really strong hopes that new plans would materialise. Well, after all, there was the precedent just down the road at Woolloomooloo. The campaign to save the area for residents started eight years ago with confrontation and anger. Today saw the opening of the first stage of the Housing Commission development. Leading figures of the Green Band movement were at today's opening, including Jack Mundy, Joe Owens and Bob Pringle. Labor's spokesman on urban and regional development, Tom Wren, also had an important role. We want governments to come together to protect our living conditions and to make sure that working class people, people not only of, of working class but lower and lower middle incomes, have got the right to be able to live on the inner city. Terrific, beautiful, mm, lovely. Do you think the character of Woolloomooloo is going to stay the same with this sort of renovation and restoration? Well, I hope so. Hope so. I've been living here for 50 years on the, in the one house and my age is 84 years old. If any of you ever had the chance to leave the loo, would you? No. No, <laughs> not in your life. no way. <laughs> and he was the proof that the Commission could rehabilitate. And we knew that costs were very considerably less than knocking over the houses and rebuilding them again. Yet it was this redevelopment mentality the Commission planners still had for Waterloo. There was nothing wrong with our terraces. And, and we felt that all the gains we'd made in the previous three years were just being eroded away. And the neighbourhood networks were splitting apart as insecurity forced more and more people to sell up and leave. We took a gamble. We really wanted to show the Commission that we were fair dinkum about negotiating. So we let the houses go that were beyond repair, but only on condition that our gesture would be matched by the Commission. We did get some action. Plans were announced for buildings on two vacant industrial sites in the proclamation area. But again, we had to wait two years more before building work could actually get started. Uh, the work has already commenced up there on 95 apartments and the carpet factory site 35 apartments. Uh, and, but these have been designed specifically for young families. And, some, and there are, for example, in the uh, cottage site, there's um, five four-bedroom dwellings and 68 three-bedroom. Now, we've never built uh, that size accommodation in the inner city. And, of course, private enterprise would not be likely to provide four-bedroom accommodation in their, in their areas. It's an expensive undertaking. They look like a step wedding cake. But certainly they're the, a far cry from what they had in mind in 72 and 73. But again, what's going to happen to the rest of the proclamation area? Uh, well, the housing in Waterloo and, uh, is very, very bad, or most of it, most of the existing dwellings. And of course, we wouldn't get any increased population. And uh, that is the problem, that we must get more people in, into these areas. And rehabilitation wouldn't cope with that. It's just, uh, it's, it's just playing a waiting game. Who breaks first? Who, um, who gives way? We constantly sort of remind the Minister that this is, these are government assets and they ought to be uh, looked after in such a state that they certainly could provide um, housing for families and relieve the, the housing crisis. But all we've got is close them up and blight um, quickly knock them over. Within the Commission there are people who believe in rehabilitation, there are others who believe in redevelopment. Um, certainly on a cost basis, which is very worrying at the moment, one would believe that rehabilitation is, must be the answer and spot buying. However, the, the realisation of the crisis, um, we, it seems to be that it's full bore, all develop, development, whatever the cost, in dollars and people terms. The 1980s will be tougher, it will be a tougher game and a tougher fight. It's the same people opposing the same forces, um, but the and the fight is definitely on.